if you're a generalist from a standing star, it's much more difficult, right? To get a really kind of exhaustive understanding of the company, if you don't know the industry, if you don't know the company, if you don't have a financial model, if you've never done any work on the name, can require a lot of time, right? I, right here, I show you an example of 60 hours. Now, many, some are in those seats where they're looking from idea to idea to idea on a generalist situation, right? If you go to the far extreme on a specialist with tight coverage, the reason they can spend four hours is because there's already a base of industry knowledge. They already have a model that's updated. They're already in the flow on sell side IR commentary. They've done the update expectations and valuation work. And so this work is already done. The incremental work to get that name in that portfolio might just be updating the thesis, running some targeted due diligence, maybe a management call, maybe a, a few other calls, right? And so that's part of the value of having a coverage approach. And even generalists that I've known, I was a generalist, like you learn industries over time. And even as a generalist, you tend to come back to the same names or the same industries, even if those are spread across three or four industries. So what I can say is it's very hard being a junior analyst and a generalist in, in an early uh, in early stages of your career where you don't have those Rolodex. What I have done, and I can, I'm happy to send this, uh, send this over to what I do. I rely a lot on different templates. Like if I'm looking at, if I want to just do a couple hours of work on a name, I will do this sniff test. Right. And so these are all fact set polls. I put in a ticker here. This is Abbott. This will basically pull the historical fundamentals and the future estimates. So I can kind of see right away what I'm working with here, right? I'm working with a company that has this level of revenue growth, um, what the gross margins have been in trajectory, what the profitability has been in trajectory, expectations. I can see what the market expects in terms of growth. I can see, okay, the market expects 17% EPS decline, I can look at the high level valuation uh, statistics, ROIC. I can look at the trajectory of revisions. So revisions have been slightly negative. I can see, you know, the 52 week high low. Okay, it's the stock's closer to its high. It's up, you know, nine percent year to date. You know, I can see leverage. I can see, and then I can kind of do a quick um, risk reward. So, okay, if if I want to do 2025 EPS. If streets at 515, let's say they do 575, 27 and a half multiple. Um, all right. Uh, sometimes I have valuation. Yeah. So I can look at the average multiple over time. The average multiple has been kind of 19. The high multiple has been, you know, high multiple more recently has been kind of like 30, has been the top multiple. Let's say in my bull base, I can do 27 and a half. So that's 33% upside in my base. I do 525 at 25. That's 10% upside. This is 475, you know, let's see, um, you know, 20. So I can kind of see, okay, just a quick kind of asymmetry, right? Keying on using just the sell side estimate as a proxy. So sell sides at 515 for 2025. Can I just kind of use that as a, hey, very quick assumption. Let's assume a nice beat in the bull, a miss in the bear, a slight beat in the base, and a range of historical multiples. And I can start to see kind of the initial asymmetry, right? So it's like this doesn't really scream to me as like meaningfully mispriced. Like maybe if the stock was at 100, all of a sudden, okay, there's something compelling here. Because maybe then if, if the base case hits, there's up 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 thirty percent, right? So that's that's how I might disqualify Abbott at one eighteen, and kind of then put a note for myself of like, okay, this is not that interesting at one twenty, but it'd be more interesting if it gets like sub one sub one hundred five, right? And I can create alerts or put that into my pipe, sort my sort of pipeline. So this is one way I like to do it. Um, So Micron, so one of the first things I like to do is I like to just look at the size of the business, right? So we've got $123 stock, we've got $135 billion market cap. I look to the, like to look at the capitalization. So we've got a little bit of net, a little bit of debt here, but on a $14 billion EBITDA number, it's really not levered. The equity to EV, it's primarily an equity. So I don't have to deal with leverage or really worry about the balance sheet here, right? This is not, as I'm thinking about continuous work, I'm not really focused on 
the balance sheet. Meaning if I build out the model, I'm probably not going to spend a lot of time on the balance, on the balance sheet. It's plenty liquid. So wherever I'm at, I can, I can, um, I can trade that. All right. I want to see where the stock is traded year to date, 123. It's kind of near its highs. Uh, just, just, just right off the highs. It's had a big move off the lows and year to date, it's been just a massive, a mass, a massive stock. Part of the reason it looks like it's been a massive stock is 2024 EPS at three bucks. Now there's been big upward revisions, right? So, you know, if you've gone through, gone through there, yeah, a big mindset of really short and intermediate term hedge funds is that stocks follow revisions. And so EPS revisions have gone from kind of $2, you know, six months ago, the company thought the street the street thought the company was going to earn 68 cents in 2024. Now they think they're going to earn three bucks. So right away, I know something really positive is going here. Like I, I, I could get, give you a general sense of how these earnings calls have gone. They're crushing numbers, revising, revising numbers higher. All right. So let's look. So that's kind of, you know, initial test. Then I kind of look at historical revenue trajectory. And so it's been a structural grower. We've gone from 9 billion in revenue the 30 billion of revenue. So a nice Kager, right? The Kager revenue growth over 10 years has been 7%. But, you know, I know enough about this stock to know it's a semiconductor. So it's real company. So it's really cyclical, cyclical rather than structural growth. They're kind of growth cyclical, right? Um, you know, this is something that would kind of screen is very interesting to me. The fact that we've gone from 12% gross margins to 45% gross margins, over the last 10 years, I'd, I'd make a note of that. I want to understand, like, that's a dramatic improvement in the margin structure, dramatic improvement in the EBITDA margin structure. And the fact that we're at kind of 50% EBITDA margins, that screams, you know, po positive to me, especially the trajectory. So have we gone, like, what's been happening in the business to uh, to get to, to get to that point? Um, you know, free cash flow, you know, historically, it's been a pretty generative, you know, business. Although, again, you've had these years where we've kind of gone um, where we've kind of um, had some cash burning years. Average ROIC has been kind of in the teens. So it's like, you know, good business, not phenomenal business. And again, EPS, EPS gone from 17 cents, really not making much money up to $8 in 2023. I don't know if they probably reported 23, so I might need to, uh, might need to update this. On a valuation basis, you know, this has been a stock that has, ha has traded in certain years at really, really low multiples, right? In 2018, it traded three to six times. It's been a really low multiple stock, although there's been periods of time as we've traded at a high multiple as well, uh, too. Um, you know, and the stock has been from the lows in 2020, 2011, it's been a phenomenal stock, right? So it's been a 25 beggar from the lows, from the lows 10 years ago, All right? So what I might do here again is uh, if my 2020, What's weird too, I'm not sure what's happening here is like they lost three bucks and then they gained three bucks and then 2025 expect to earn eight bucks. So yeah, may maybe what I do, it looks like revisions have gone up in a big way. So maybe I had 12 times on a 15, uh, 15 PE. I, I wouldn't want to get over my skis, obviously paying a high multiple. Historically, this hasn't been a super high multiple. It's been a lower multiple stock than an NVIDIA, for example. NVIDIA has historically been a 30 to 40 PE. This is closer to a 10 to 12 PE. So maybe my peak multiple would be 25. You know, if I do nine, nine, 25, you know, nine, 25 on a 12 and a half, that kind of gets me no return. And if for some reason these EPS numbers are a cyclical peak, which it looks like they might be, and we go back to a $3 number, back to it, back to a seven PE, there's certainly a situation where the risk case could get really gnarly in this one. And so surprise, surprise, it's probably a similar outcome. I would get to you, I'm not saying this is a short, but fundamentally, just the basic kind of risk reward math tells me my hunch would be at some point the stock sells off materially from 123. Not to say it's going to going to quickly, but the fact that margins seem to be at kind of peak levels, where some sort of cyclical peak. I don't know if they're getting some AI tailwind or what's going on here, but the eight dollar number kind of in line with. You know the the twelve dollar peak. Hey, we've seen this story before. The peak in twenty, the peak in margins in twenty um, uh, eighteen didn't play out very well. It's kind of boom to, turned to bust. Margins went from fifty percent to sixteen percent. So I'd be careful in capitalizing a peak, a peak, uh, peak on peak sort of scenario here.